We're going to begin by singing a couple of songs of praise and worship to God. There is no rock, there is no God like our God. Sing it together the evening. There is no rock, there is no God like our God. No other name worthy of all our praise. The rock of salvation that cannot be moved has proven himself to be faithful and true. There is no rock, there is no God like ours. Rock of ages, rock of ages. of ages, Jesus is the rock, rock of ages, Jesus is the rock, there is no rock, there is no God like ours, from the beginning, there is no rock. Salvation that cannot be moved, proving himself to be faithful and true. There is no rock, there is no God like ours. He's the rock of ages, rock of ages. Jesus is the rock, rock of ages. Jesus is the rock, rock of ages. of ages, Jesus is the rock, rock of ages, Jesus is the rock, rock of ages, Jesus is the rock, there is no rock, there is no God like ours, there is no rock, there is no rock, No rock, there is no God like ours. We're going to slow it down this evening and sing your love, O Lord. And as we sing this song, let's worship God from our hearts. And after this song, we're going to take a moment to praise God together and give Him all the glory. Your love.
sando roko riba, yende de basho roko riba, no si ala mande, via la dosi ki anda shi oroko remande. Glory to God, glory to Jesus, hallelujah. It's going to take a moment to pray. Father God, we pray your blessing upon the service this evening, that you'd speak to our hearts, no matter where we are geographically, Lord God, we have gathered together to hear your voice, to allow your word to challenge us and help us. Father God, I pray, bless the Hornsby Church this evening. Help every individual believer, Lord God. I pray, help every person who's listening to this service, bring a blessing upon their life. Father God, I pray, bring souls to salvation. Let these words reach the lost, Lord God, that they would come to you. Build your church even in this season lord god bless our fellowship churches as they gathered this evening to hear your word i pray your blessing upon this time in jesus name amen welcome out to our wednesday evening service here at the potter's house church hornsby appreciate you joining us if you want to know more about our church you can go to www.pottershousehornsby.com and there's a lot of information there as well as our contact uh, contact details we'd love to hear from you and uh, you're welcome to do that and uh, God bless you this evening. So just before we get into the preaching, as we always do, we want to worship God not just with our voices, but with our giving. We want to take an offering. You know, God has been helping us this evening. I really do appreciate uh, those who've been faithful to continue to pay their tithes and offerings to God in this season. I encourage you to keep doing that. And I want to bring a challenge to those who perhaps you haven't been doing that. Uh, I know that it's a difficult season for many and uh, I appreciate that this evening, but it's important to be faithful in every season of life. In fact, it's probably more important to be faithful when things are difficult because that really does reveal where our heart is at. And so I want to just encourage you this evening uh, with the words that Paul uh, gave the uh, faithful church at Philippians or the Philippian church. He says, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory. I'm confident this evening that no matter what you're going through, as you're faithful to give to God, he should supply all your needs. So let's give this evening. Let's pray over the offering. Father God, I pray, bless this offering. Lord God, use it, I pray, to uh, somehow build the kingdom of God. Lord God, to bless the saints of God as they give. I pray I break a spirit of mammon. I break a spirit of covetousness. And I release a spirit of liberality among your people. I release a spirit of faith instead of fear, Lord God, that people will be faithful to give their tithes and offerings besides. And as they do that, you'd open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing into their lives. I pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Well, once again, thank you for joining us. Uh, this evening, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 26 and verse 57 and 58. We'll read the scripture in just a moment. There are a number of ways we learn in life. One of the most common ways we learn is through trial and error. And uh, unfortunately, there's too many errors a lot of times. Uh, but a lot of times we can avoid the trials and we can avoid the errors by learning from someone else's life. They call them life lessons. For example... Let me give you three great life lessons from Britain's wartime Prime Minister, Sir Winston Churchill. Churchill said, Now is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. And his life lesson here is, live life to the fullest. That you would live every day understanding that it's, a, it's an important part of what is happening in your life. Here's another one. Churchill said, it's a mistake to look too far ahead. Only one link in the chain of destiny can be handled at a time. So here's life lesson number two from Sir Winston Churchill. Focus on the present. Here's a third statement from Winston Churchill. Continuous effort, not strength or intelligence, is the key to unlocking our potential. Life lesson number three, don't give up. That it's continuous effort that brings the breakthrough. Now when it comes to the Christian life, some of the best life lessons come from one of the disciples, one disciple in particular who many people relate to, the disciple Peter. And so we're going to look at Peter's life lessons this evening. Our text is Matthew chapter 26, verse 57 and 58. If you have a Bible, look at that with me this evening. And those who had laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance to the high priest's courtyard and he went in and sat with the servants to see the end. I want to think with you about Peter's life lessons and talk, and talk to you first of all uh, about the first lesson and that is that you cannot follow at a distance. I was in the supermarket the other day 
and I turned the corner of an aisle and there was a guy coming the other way and he recoiled like he'd come across a murder scene or something terrible. You know, we are getting more and more used to living at a distance and less and less comfortable about being in proximity to other people. There's a phenomenon called the bystander effect and it's the idea that people don't want to get too involved with other people. There was a, uh, an infamous incident in New York where a 28-year-old woman was uh, ter- uh, stabbed to death. And during the crime, she screamed for help for over 90 minutes. 38 people heard her, but no one did anything to help her. And the conclusion to the incident was the more bystanders the less likely there is going to be one individual who's willing to help. There's something about other people's lives, the messiness, the hassle of it, that causes people to withdraw. The idea that if I perhaps get involved with some sort of uh, helping someone else, if there's a crime that I'm witnessing and I get involved, there's going to be paperwork and I might have to go to court and be a witness. And so what a hassle. Easy just to avoid getting involved. There's also the fear. If I get involved, then maybe I'll become a victim. Maybe the murderer will turn his knife on me. As Christians, we are meant to overcome the bystander effect. We are not to withdraw from people. We are not to withdraw from people's needs. We are meant to draw near. We are meant to somehow be a people that would respond to people's needs and help people with needs. We're not meant to withdraw in our relationship with Jesus Christ when things get tough. We're meant to draw nearer to him in prayer and in fellowship. And there are some steps Peter takes in our text uh, or that lead up uh, to our text uh, that led to his denial of Jesus Christ that we can learn from or we can learn some life lessons from. Step one is that Peter ignored the early warning signs. Jesus had warned him before the rooster crowed, he would deny the Christ three times. And instead of listening to these words of warning from Jesus Christ, Peter challenges the words. In Matthew 26, verse 33 and 34, Peter declared, even if everyone else deserts you, I will never desert you. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Peter, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny three times that you even know me. The most dangerous words in the world. It will never happen to me. I would never do that. I would never go there. I would never deny. I would never fail. And the reason those are dangerous words is because it causes you to drop your guard. John Sedgwick was a Union officer in the American Civil War who spoke the famous last words. They couldn't hit an elephant at this distance before he was shot just below the left eye and was killed. Moments earlier, he'd been rejecting the warnings of subordinates to keep his head down because of enemy snipers. Some people act as if the warnings don't apply to them. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. God has dozens of ways of warning us, doesn't he? He uses his word. He uses the word of God preached. He uses the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will sometimes just send an alarm bell in your heart to let you know something's not right, that you need to deal with something. There's pastoral counsel. There's the preaching of the word of God. There's advice of friends. And my question is, do you heed the warnings? There's a second step Peter took, and that is he began to withdraw from Jesus and follow at a distance. I wonder why. I suspect it's because it was getting real now. When the demands of Christ and following Jesus Christ begin to get real, when we really do need to begin to die to ourselves, when we're confronted with the cross that we're to take up as we follow Jesus Christ, some disciples pull on the brakes, say, whoa, whoa, time to step back for a moment. And it might not be outright abandonment of Jesus Christ, but let's just take it back a notch. People follow at a distance because it's closer to the exit. It's easier to beat a hasty retreat when you're further back 
than when you're close to where the action is. You know, people have often associated peer pressure exclusively with the negative outcomes, but peer pressure can also be a positive thing, can bring some positive outcomes in your life. Someone has said that the fastest way to change yourself is to hang out with people who are already the way you want to be. Another man said, surround yourself with people who force you to be better. So Peter began to draw back. The other thing he began to do is he began to relax around sinners. In verse 58 of our text, Peter followed at a distance to the high priest's courtyard and he went in and sat down with the servants to see the end. See, in this crisis, he's no longer with his brethren. He's with the unsaved. He's missing out on being encouraged. He's missing out on being an encouragement in this difficult time. And ultimately, we become like the people we spend the most time with. It says in Mark chapter 14, verse 71, Peter began to curse and swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. One of the terrible things that can begin to happen in the Christian's life is they begin to follow Jesus Christ at a distance. And this is a life lesson that Peter teaches us that nothing good comes of that. I want to talk to you about lesson two from Peter's life. And that is that people will follow you. The New Zealand Herald newspaper reported in October last year that a family was lucky to be alive after driving for at least three kilometres on the wrong side of a busy road in South Auckland. Witnesses were frantically trying to get the car to stop, but the father of the Filipino family drove on at 70 kilometres an hour, thinking it was a two-way highway, while motorists desperately tried to signal for him to pull over. And my point is, is that as he drove along, it wasn't just him in the car. He was taking his wife and young daughter along with him for the ride. And the point is, is that people follow us. People are, are going to go in the same direction that we are. The poet has said, no man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, part of the main. We are all connected. We are all influencing someone. Tupac Shakur said, I don't want to be a role model. I just want to be someone who says, this is who I am. This is what I do. I say what's on my mind. Tupac might not want to have been a role model. And yet there is a Tupac clothing line, Tupac shoe collections, Tupac jewelry you can buy to be just like him. Because people want to be just like him, whether he wants to be a role model or not. People want to follow him or be like him. And whether you want it or not, your life is going to influence other people. Let's uh, continue on in this story with Peter. And we're going to look at John 21, verse 1 to 3. After these things, Jesus showed him again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we are going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat and that night they caught nothing. So again, there's some life lessons here. One of the life lessons is be careful who you follow. Think about this. Peter, as we know, has been following at a distance. He's been swearing and cursing. He's denied the Lord Jesus Christ three times. And now he's heading back to secular work, feeling defeated and discouraged. And he's leaving discipleship behind him. And wisdom would tell you, this man is not in a good place. Do not follow this man at this point of time. And yet there's a trail of men saying, we're going with you, Peter. What you're doing, we're doing as well. You know, one of the mysteries of the kingdom of God, why do bad examples have such a good following? There's another lesson, and that is that there is someone referencing off you. There are people who are going to follow in your footsteps. One pastor was telling me that someone sent him a series of pictures of people watching an online church service. And there are people there in their pajamas, their cartoon character onesies, and uh, some people in bed with the breakfast tray, watching all the pastors preaching away in live stream. 
and they send it to the pastor thinking the pastor will get a laugh out of this. This is funny. That's not funny at all. That's depressing. I personally got convicted about just sitting and watching church with my family after preaching these messages and then watching them with my family. I got convicted and so now we sing and we praise and we pray. And I've got to be honest, the scene, it feels a little odd. I feel a little odd. But it's a lot better than passively spectating the church service. Plus, it's a much better example to my family. And over the three months of online services, your kids and your wife, they're going to be following you. Will they still be praying? Will they still be singing? Will they still be uh, reverent towards the things of God? When we finally come out of this time of restricted movement and not being able to meet in the church building. You know, they say in the Spanish flu pandemic 100 years ago, uh, which is similar to what we're going through now, that it took the churches years to recover the congregations. That something happened in that period of lockdown. God forbid that that would happen now. People are following us. People are referencing of us. It says in Ecclesiastes 9 verse 18, it's a sober warning. Better to have wisdom than weapons of war, but one sinner can destroy much that is good. There's a third lesson from this uh, incident that we read about in John 21, and that is not being in the will of God is ultimately a bad idea. In John 21 verse 3, it says they got on a boat, they fished all night, and they caught nothing. Now, I've been saved 35 years this November, and I can honestly say, that I've never seen anybody better off drawing back from serving God. I can honestly say that ultimately, people who do best, who have the best marriages, the best lives, are those who stay in the centre of God's will. We can be an influence for great good. We can influence others to serve God or we can be a bad influence. The reality is, whether we want to or not, people are going to follow our example and use our example either as an excuse or an inspiration. I want to talk to you thirdly about a third lesson, and that is that your best life involves narrowing options. There's a story about how they trap monkeys in South India. The trap consists of a hollowed out coconut chained to a stake. The coconut has some rice inside, which can be grabbed through a small hole. The monkey's hand fits through the hole, but his clenched fist can't pull it back out. The monkey is suddenly trapped, but not by anything physical. He's trapped by a false idea that everything I can get my hands on is good for me. The will of God for your life involves letting go of some things so that we can attain something better. In John 21, verse 18 to 22, Jesus finds Peter and he does a, a work of restoration. Peter has denied Jesus three times. Jesus asks him three times, do you love me, Peter? And he challenges him to feed the sheep. And after his denials and after his restoration, Jesus says these words, John 21, verse 18 to 22. I tell you the truth. When you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself and went wherever you wanted to go. But when you're old, you'll stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. This he spoke signifying by what death Peter would glorify God. When he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. And then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, who also had leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter seeing him, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if I will that he remains till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Following Jesus this evening involves a narrowing of options. It says, or Jesus says to Peter, when you're a young man, you did what you wanted. You ran free like the buffalo, Peter. You did what you pleased. You went where you wanted. You, you did whatever uh, it was pleasing to you. And it didn't affect really anybody. It wasn't a big deal. But as you grow, as you gain ministry, as you gain influence, that's a great pr uh, privilege and, and a, a great joy in life. Uh, but with that comes this. Your life becomes less your own. 
You're going to have responsibility to have your own vital and up-to-date relationship with God. You're going to have a responsibility to be a practical example to others, even when you don't feel like it. You need to be that example. He had to maintain a standard so that he wouldn't be a stumbling block for someone else. So that as he preached the message of God, no one could bring that message into reproach. Following Jesus means a narrowing of lanes to run in. And the more you follow him, the longer you follow him, the more you find the options begin to narrow. Because when uh, Peter asked about John's lane, wondering if that might be a better lane to swap into, perhaps, Jesus said to him, don't worry about John's lane. Run your lane. Your job is not to worry what other people do or don't do and use that as an excuse for your life. Your job is to run your lane. Jesus said to him very simply, two words, follow me. We can do that, right? No matter what other people are doing. You need to be honestly able to say you're following Jesus. And the reason is simple. is because the ultimate reward in life is following Jesus and to be able to hear the words of Jesus Christ. Well done, good and faithful servant. Because I'm convinced this evening that no school certificate, no sporting achievement, no work accolade will ever come close to matching those words that Jesus would say to us. Matthew 25, verse 23, his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Have you ever seen those World War II recruiting posters? They're very inspirational. They somehow stir you to sign up and uh, be involved with defending your country. There's pictures of troops marching into battle and uh, defending their country. And uh, there's a famous poster of a woman in overalls and a scarf uh, flexing her muscle, uh, doing her part, doing her bit for the war, being involved with the military effort. And it's the idea, the idea of these posters is that being involved with the military effort brings out the best in you. And it does. Being in the military brought restrictions on these people's lives, brought restrictions on their time and what they could and couldn't be involved in, made demands of them, but it also made them what has been referred to as the greatest generation. You know, following Jesus Christ will bring out the very best in you. And yes, it involves narrowing of some options. Yes, it involves challenges about how you use your time and what kind of example you're setting. But I want to encourage you to learn the life lessons that Peter teaches us through the word of God. I want to close in a word of prayer this evening. And I want to first of all say that if you're not a Christian, that the invitation of Jesus Christ is that you would follow him. In Matthew 11, verse 28, it says, Jesus says, come to me. All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. You know, that's the will of God for your life is not to add to your burdens, but to relieve your burdens and to give you a better life. I've preached some challenging thoughts this evening, but the reality is serving God is far greater and far more enjoyable than the wages and the wearing away of sin. And so I want to invite you this evening, if you're not right with God, you can be. If you're a sinner this evening, you need to repent of your sin and receive Jesus Christ and he will remove the burden that you're carrying and give you eternal life. If you want to do that, pray this prayer with me. Father God, I admit I'm a sinner. Forgive me for my sin. I repent and I surrender to Jesus Christ. I believe he died on the cross for me. I believe he shed his blood for me. And I believe he rose again from the dead to give me new life. Right now, help me to be a Christian. I thank you for the gift of eternal life. In the name of Jesus, amen. If you've prayed that prayer, I invite you to get in contact with us. Our contact details are in the description below. And finally, this evening, I want to bring a challenge to the Christians that are listening to this message. There are some life lessons here. Don't ignore the warnings. Don't follow at a distance. Don't be more cozy with sinners than the people of God. Peter teaches, teaches us these things. Know this evening that your life is influencing others and ask yourself honestly, what kind of influence are you? 
Are you an influence people can point to? Can, can your pastor point to your life and say, there's a man that you should be like? Or there's a woman that you should serve God like? And finally this evening, understand that, yes, the Christian life does involve narrowing of options. That there is a lane that God has for you. And uh, it might seem restrictive, but it's actually liberating to know the direction of your life. It's actually liberating to know that God has a lane for you. And if you could boil it down to this, it's follow Jesus Christ. As you do that, you'll discover God's great purpose for your life and live for that moment where Jesus says to you, well done, good and faithful servant. I appreciate you joining us online for service this evening. Pray about these things. Spend some time with God. Continue to pray. Read your Bible this week and we'll see you again on Sunday. God bless you.